I do think like AI and data analytics is going to change our roles in, in very significant ways. And I think the, 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 the most significant way is I don't think the actuaries are going to be the ones actually doing the calculations in Excel anymore, right? We're going to have AI. You're going to drop in a, a reserve calculation into chat GPT or something else. They're going to calculate it now. So hi, Dave. Thanks so much for being here today. Uh, so to start off, can you please give our viewers a brief introduction about your background and experience as a health actuary? Thanks, V, for having me. I really appreciate it. Uh, I, I think I might be your first or one of your few health actuaries that you've discussed, uh, you know, talked to. So I appreciate that. Um, so my background, I've always been a health actuary. Uh, it's been about 27 years now, and I might be a lot of, uh, you know, like a lot of actuaries, I kind of stumbled into my first job, right? Um, I'm from Oklahoma. There are not a whole lot of jobs in Oklahoma. And I had some opportunities to go up north and, you know, maybe live where you did or, you know, northern U.S. And it was too cold. So I wanted to move. I wanted to stay in the south. But again, there aren't many jobs. So I, I uh, didn't have many opportunities. I found a health actuary job in Little Rock, Arkansas. And I was like, I'll take it. Didn't know much uh, about health actuarial work versus anything else. But I do think it, I don't know if you want to say just luck or fate or whatever. It's definitely where I, I think in hindsight where I needed to be was with the health world. So I worked at a Blue Cross in Blue Shield uh, for three years. And then I'm not afraid to say I chased a woman to Dallas, Texas. And as I, as I always joke, I guess I made the right decision. We're still married and have three kids. So I've been in Dallas at Lewis and Ellis as a health consultant for 24 years. And I think what I really like about it in terms of my background, it is now diverse. So as a consultant, I will I have a lot of different clients. I have small insurance companies. I have law, large insurance companies that everyone's heard of as clients. I've, I do a lot of um, regulatory work with states and things like that. So, and again, and because of that, I do a lot of different stuff with different products. So I think if you ask most people, uh, they may know me as a regulatory Affordable Care Act, healthcare reform actuary, but I also do a lot of voluntary benefit pricing. So I price a lot of critical illness products, uh, you know, accident products, things like that. And then what makes it exciting is about a third of my job is whatever project I get next week that I may not even know what it is. So I might do work with pharmacy benefit managers. I might do uh, financial valuation, that kind of thing. So it, it's, it's been very varied and that's what I've liked about it. That's great. And I would say like, I think a lot of us like it's also part of like fate or luck or destiny that we just stumble into what we're doing and as long as we're falling in love with it, we committed, you know, we find it like satisfactory, like I think that's a bless blissful life as well. So Exactly. Yeah. I mean it's you know, I know other actuaries that have you know, started in one field and drifted to the other. And that's great because you don't know, you know, and a lot of, as you know, this field is pretty small and there aren't a whole lot of jobs. So sometimes you do have to take that first leap and, and then go from there. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, for sure. And um, now that we have a better understanding about your background, like I think let's dive a little bit more into your experience of a health actuaries in your roles and responsibilities, especially how they contribute to the overall functioning of the health insurance industry, which I, I know is quite different in the US compared to Canada. Yeah, I think that's what's interesting. And, and, and one thing, I mean, I, I knew it as I've, you know, aged through the, the career, but it is interesting to be in a field where we do it different than everyone else across the world, right? So, you know, um, you know, life insurance, a lot. yes, I know there's changing rules and there's IFRS and I can barely spell IFRS, but um, I know that is, you know, becoming more applicable everywhere, right? And in the US as a health actuary, there's not much that's applicable elsewhere. Um, so that's a little bit, you know, that's what's interesting is I don't, uh, at least from a work perspective, I don't get to see a whole lot of internet, international perspectives, which I, I wish I could. 
Um, I've had a few international clients, but 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 not much. But I think my role, so within the US, I think I've had the pleasure of, I, I mentioned earlier, doing a lot of state work. And with the passage of the Affordable Care Act, which did, you know, w- while the US was so different, uh, you know, we, we changed it in 2010 and it changed what we were doing in the US completely, uh, completely changed the rules. And I was fortunate enough to have done similar work before the passage of the ACA. So about 2007 to 2008, I'd assisted the states of Ohio and Tennessee with some healthcare reform initiatives. And because of that, I'd had some experience with it. And so when the ACA was passed, I was able to help quite a few states. So with implementation. So I think I've worked with about 22 states out of the out of the 50 in the U.S., uh, don't hold me to that if I'm off one or two. Don't go fact checking me. But um, it was about 22 states where I've had, uh, you know, the opportunity to help shape and form the the healthcare system in those states. So, and you know, you're, you're not based in the in the U.S., but you know, and it's, this probably is it too different everywhere. You know, health health insurance. One reason because it is in the uh, the way we do it in the U.S. It is very political. And that is an experience that I never really thought about as just a little old number crunching actuary, right? I deal with politicians quite a bit. I deal with, um, you know, state regulators and health insurance is very political. And you just read a newspaper anytime one side of the political aisle proposes something that may or may not be good objectively, but the other side just automatically says it's horrible even if it is maybe objectively decent. So navigating those waters has, has been very interesting. And, and I think, you know, I think it has been an important role and it, it's been kind of fun because it's a little, it, you know, it, it gets me into do some stuff that's not necessarily traditional actuarial stuff, but it's using my actuarial skills to help the states with healthcare reform and that kind of stuff. Yeah, thanks for the insight. I think I never thought about the political aspect of it, but I think it definitely makes sense in the Yeah, US it's funny. So, yeah, and you may not get this reference since you're not based in the U.S., but so I, I usually joke. So I do work for the states of Vermont and uh, of, of the, the states I work with, it includes the state of Vermont and the state of Louisiana. Politically speaking, they are completely different. And so, as I always joke, that when, when I give the same answer to Vermont and Louisiana on something and they both yell at me, then I know I probably did something right because I know I'm kind of in the middle because they're both so different on the political aisles, you know. That's great. That's that's very interesting aspect yeah. of it. Yeah, for sure. So now I'm curious about like uh, your typical days look like as a health actuary. I know you did say that like sometimes you don't even know what kind of project that you're gonna have uh, for the next week or so. So how do you balance like your work on those various projects? Yeah, it, 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 it is hard. And I'm actually um, at my work, I'm actually in the process of interviewing several actuaries to join our team. And as I always tell them that I have to be very upfront in that it can be a challenge for some actuaries. And you know, like when, when my first job, I had one boss, I did one actuarial task almost every week, all week. As a consultant, and especially in the health insurance world where health insurance things change quite a bit, and I think it's a little more dynamic, rules change a lot compared to um, some of the other actuarial disciplines. So I tell the candidates when I interview them that they have to be prepared to work on projects they've never even heard of. They have to be comfortable with spending time researching. They have to be, they, they, um, you know, they, they have to be very comfortable working for four to five bosses. And the way I describe it at my firm, you know, we have, you know, we have about 20 partners in our firm and, uh, uh, an actuary an ASA, let's say might work for five different partners at the same time with different timelines and different things like that. And so that can be a challenge. I love it now, but I've been doing it 24 years. But the way I tell them is it's, that is a consulting role, right? So now as I've progressed, you know, that was how my career kind of was. And now I've progressed as a partner in my firm. You know, I have 20 different clients at any given time and they're all telling me they need something on Monday at five o'clock. And then how do you juggle that? And how do you work through that? So, um, you know, that that is 
an interesting dynamic of my job is it, it, it is, it is juggling a lot of things at once and you've got to learn to do that. And I do think I probably struggled early too, with not knowing something, you know, I think as actuaries, you know, we're very confident in our abilities and to certain things, but when there's a product, you don't know, it took me a little while, you know, when I get a project and I'm like, I've never heard of this type of product. I don't know anything about it. Where do I get the data? That kind of thing. That's something that's also kind of interesting in the health world is there's a lot of new stuff, which means there's no data. So how do you model? How do you put a premium on something when there's no data? And so a lot of my day to day is, you know, again, juggling those pro different projects, you know, working with different clients. But I'll, I'll be honest, also, as a, as a consultant, as you mentioned, is part of my day to day is also trying to get that next project. So as a consultant, you know, as a consultant in a consulting firm, you know, I am talking to a lot of insurance companies and see how you know, I can help them, partner with them, help them you know, solve some kind of problem, whatever it is. And so it's, it's a mix of trying to get new clients and, and working on the projects for a current client. It's fascinating to learn about like the intricate of your daily work. And I would say like from what you say, uh, I guess adaptability is like a great quality that somebody want to be in this field, especially in the consultant field, uh, need to have in order to like manage multiple projects and they just adapt with new changes and changing priorities on the time. So from that sense, it's like I want to explore a little bit more about like the skill and knowledge uh, necessary to be successful in this field, right? As you're saying that you're like looking for people to join your team. Mm -hmm. So like what are the key skill or knowledge you want the candidate to have and any, are there any particular resource or developments that have been helpful for your own development as well? Yeah, so it's funny. So as a health actuary, and there are some health actuaries that, you know, have different roles than I do. So I can only speak for myself, but I know I haven't used life contingencies in 25 years. I actually just uh, went and spoke at my alma mater and I was talking to my old professor who's there, Professor Shu, and I told him, I go, you'd be embarrassed. I literally probably couldn't calculate the value of an annuity of four payments for four more years. Like, I mean, I, that is gone. I don't use that, those actuarial skills very much anymore, but I, I do, I do think, you know, the skills I use as a health actuary now is it's almost more of the statistics we've learned through the exams. It's much more of statistics day to day than I would say, you know, some of the actuarial math um, that, that we have been educated on. You know, at the upper exams, um, you know, when you get your FSA, a lot of those exams do a great job getting into that stuff and, and learn in it. And again, a lot of it is learning about dealing with limited data sets, you know, and that kind of thing. So. It is a challenge. It, it is a little different in my role as a health actuary. I don't necessarily use a lot of the skills that I learned through the exam process. And I will also say, and I, I've kind of alluded to this throughout, but I do think as a consultant, and I think this, I think this translates over to non-consultants in the health world too, is the, the communication aspect. Uh, because a lot of times, especially as a consultant, we do have multiple clients with different personalities and we don't just have the one boss, you know, we have multiple bosses and things like that. We do have to learn to communicate that. And, and so one thing I did about three years ago now, you know, I'd like to think I was a decent communicator before. I, I think it did help to get to, you know, my success that I have had, but I did engage a professional coach and I, about three years ago, and it's been Great. And, and it was primarily centered on a couple of things we've talked about. One is helping me with communication and, you know, what to do there. But it's also helped with that kind of that day to day stuff we were talking about, because I do think as an actuary, we're so good at the task at hand. And I, I will readily admit I struggle with I want to solve a problem before I move on to the next thing. And sometimes when you have multiple projects and multiple th clients, Sometimes you can you only have an hour to spend on it. So I'll spend an hour and it's tough, but then I'll give it up and I'll go to the next thing and then I'll, you know, come back to it later. So I really would recommend I, at least um, I would recommend a lot of like just time management. 
I think that is fascinating because I don't think a lot of actuaries get that training, right? We, again, I think we get the training. Here's a problem. Let's solve that problem from start to finish, right? But they don't talk about what if you only, you know, have a certain amount of time and you have multiple things going on, which one do you choose? I mentioned earlier, my, my staff may have five projects with five different bosses. How do you learn to decide which one's first? Or how do you communicate that to your one of, you know, two of your five bosses that, you know what, today I need to not work on your project. I've got to work on something else. Um, now, specifically to like the health insurance world, we've alluded or we've talked about how it is so political in the US. And a lot of the information out there is biased. It really is, you know, depending on who wrote who wrote something, who puts it out. So I really do look for as much objective analysis and comment as I can for the health world. I mean, the Society of Actuaries puts out great stuff. Dale Hall, who's the uh, actuary in charge of research at the SOA, does fantastic stuff. And Achilles, um, who does the health research stuff, it's fantastic. Uh, they just recently, uh, Achilles recently just um, did a report on um, the impact of COVID-19 moving forward, you know, on claims cost. So that kind of stuff is great. I also would recommend uh, it's now shortened to KFF, which is Kaiser Family Foundation. It's an organization in the U.S. And they just put out a bunch of data and comments about what's help, uh, about like health policy. So it's very nonpartisan and it's great. So I highly recommend, you know, reading a lot um, and then figuring out which stuff you're not going to read anymore because you can kind of figure out it's biased and then stick with those great sources. That's great. Yeah, I think those will be great resources for someone to get into the health uh, industry. And from that aspect, I think we talk a little bit about like communications and time management and the knowledge. And from that, I would also see that like as health actuary, we also need to work with a lot of other professional as well. Right. So this is about collaborations. So how do health actuaries actually collaborate with other professionals? Like who do you usually work with? Yeah, so it's a great question because there's a, there are a lot of different answers to that and, and that I have had. So I mentioned helping states with health care reform. The state of Louisiana, when uh, the Affordable Care Act was passed, essentially didn't have any health insurance laws. And they were not set up to implement provisions of the ACA, um, as maybe as well as some of the other states in the U.S., like New York and states in the Northeast. And so I was engaged by the state of Louisiana to assist them in writing their insurance laws. So I had to work with healthcare attorneys. I, at, to that point, I had not worked with a lot of healthcare attorneys. And it's amazing, even though healthcare attorneys, uh, you know, do a, you know, a, they're in the same field as we do. We definitely have a different language, right? They're usually very non-technical. We're very technical. And you've got to learn to bridge that gap. And, and again, that's where that communication comes in. Um, I, I think it is super important as someone that's in a highly technical field, we have to figure out how to cu communicate in a non-technical way. And, you know, like I, I am a football fan from the state of Oklahoma. Football is ingrained in us. And, and so I tend to lean towards football analogies, sports analogies, because that is a way to bridge that gap with people that aren't technical, you know, and they may not understand the, the number development. So, you know, in that case in Louisiana, you know, I'd have to try to communicate those things. So that is a, that is one example. Another example of non-actuaries I deal with quite a bit are insurance agents or brokers, the people that sell the insurance. Right. And a lot of my clients and the insurers I work for, my direct contacts are the marketing people, maybe the chief marketing officer, because they're the ones helping develop the products from the insurance company side. They may not have their own actuaries or they have actuaries that do other other stuff. Um, you know, they maybe don't do product development. So I have to interact with insurance agents and these brokers. And again, they may not be as technical on some stuff. And so again, you've got to learn to communicate in a non-technical way. You know, the way I always joke when I, when I develop a, help develop a product uh, for, uh, with an insurance company with a, with a marketer, 
I always say if, if the agent and the actuary agree, then we got a perfect product because there's almost always disagreement getting to that point. You know, I may say something's too low and he always says it's too high and because they want a lower rate to sell, but I talk about solvency of the product. And once we hit that middle point, or hopefully we do, then it's like bells are going off and it's golden. We know it's perfect. So again, there, you know, I, I think those are the, the two easiest examples to think of that, you know, there are a lot of players in the insurance field that aren't technical and you've got to learn to communicate those uh, to them. Yeah, I would say like different people, different forces, in a way, make make you in check and for for sure for to be like more competitive to produce like as you say a great product, right? That would offer value and serve the society as well. Yeah, you know, another example you you were saying that is you know maybe a more similar field to what we do is like the accountants. So I I interact with a lot of insurance accountants, and you know some of what we do is very similar to accounting right you know we have to project out the liabilities and 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 count how many beans there's going to be and that kind of stuff but they have a different view of it than we do and and there are a couple things there's a um th i know this is this term i'm about to say means something different in in the life insurance world but in the health insurance world there's premium deficiency reserves and we have our own kind of definition of that and and that's something where it's very gray. You know, the rules and regulations aren't super clear and the accountants are heavily involved in it. And I, you know, and I will say that was a case where, you know, I've had communications where with the accountants on this issue, it's regarding financial statements where, you know, I've, I'm like, I'm glad I had that conversation. Like they convinced me of kind of, you know, moving my opinion a little bit and I can see their opinion. So, you know, so, you know, the accountants, you know, again, that's another example of, you know, uh, an insurance field that is similar, it's different, and we got to learn to kind of talk it out. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. I can see like having like open communications and also like trust building and being collaborative. It's like always like making making the relationship and the process and produce better results for sure. Definitely. Yeah. So I think we talk a little bit about like, uh, so this industry is uh, heavily impacted by regulators and politics in a way that like it impacted. But another aspect is that the rapid advancement in technology and data analytics as, as well, right? Just like how the chat GPT was introduced this, mm -hmm. this year. So how do you see the role of like a health actuary evolving in the future? And like, what advice would you give to the aspiring actuary to stay ahead of the curve in this dynamic industry? So I don't want this, I don't want this to come across as doom and gloom. Um, I actually kind of, I, I alluded to earlier that I, I went and spoke at my alma mater, uh, University of Iowa, and, and I was asked a very similar question. And I think a few people may have taken it as a little more doom and gloom, but I do think like AI and data analytics is going to change our roles in, in very significant ways. And I think the, 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 the most significant way is, I don't think the actuaries are gonna be the ones actually doing the calculations in Excel anymore, right? We're gonna have AI, you're gonna drop in a, a reserve calculation into chat GPT or something else, they're gonna calculate it. Now, how do you, deal with that how do you so you do need to know enough to maybe validate what the ai does so you do have to be trained in it but we're, i think actuaries are going to start being put in roles where they have to communicate the result like i mentioned to the accountants a few minutes ago i'm going to have to communicate my actuarial liability estimates that may be an ai calculated and i have to communicate that to somebody how do you communicate something you may not have done the calculation for? I think so. I think it's going to, again, really serious to that communication stuff. And, and it's, I think it's that adaptability. I, I know the Society of Actuaries has talked multiple times about, you know, um, like the adaptability quotient and the emotional quotient and how to blend that into the exam questions, because I think we're going to be put in situations where we may be uncomfortable because we did not physically do it, but we have to explain it, understand it, and then exp explain it. So I think our roles are going to change in that we have to be trained up enough to know how to do the calculations. But man, I really see that, you know, in the semi near future, 
we may not be doing that work. I totally agree with you because <laughs> uh, personally, I've been using ChatGPT like the 4.0, like the plus yes. version. Yes. Very almost every day, like just for my own side project and like yep. the content channel and everything. And and you are really correct in terms of first, we have to know enough to verify it because like sometimes it gives me the answer and say like, you know what? I don't think this is right according to my own knowledge yep. and you want to continue to chatting and provide the, the correct prompt so that like it's give you more brainstorm more ideas and then it develops something better so I, I i totally agree that like i think it's it's about the communication it's about how we can leverage this very powerful tool in order to like help turning it into decision making and communicate as result and explaining to other people because again it's, it's also a communication between us and chat GPT. To well, make I was sure. just about to say that. That's a great point. I was just about to say that, but you kind of have to learn to communicate with chat, chat GPT to get you what you want calculated, yeah. right? Like I've learned to ask better questions and you might get a slightly different answer than you want. And you go, well, why did it give me that answer? And you do, you're right. You do kind of have to learn how to ask things in certain ways. So yeah, you're communicating with a computer system and it, it's interesting. Yeah, for sure. And uh, and I, I heard somebody call that like, hey, it's not AI that replace you, but the people the people that use AI that are gonna replace you. And I have to say- It's a good, yep. it's a good way of saying it, yep. <laughs> yeah, so in a way it's, it's, it's a lot of opportunity in this as well. So it's uh, fascinating how like the world can change very quickly. Yeah, it definitely does. I mean, I, it's funny, you're talking about like my background, I'll never forget my first week on the job um, at my current employer. So that was 24 years ago. And this was just, you know, to tell you how things have changed. I got a call from one of the partners in the firm who was, you know, down the hall. And he said, I need you for a minute. I said, okay. So I go down to his office and he needed me to forward an email that he had received to me because he didn't, he had never had email before. And he didn't even know, like it's sitting in his in inbox. He didn't even know what this email thing was, right? And I had to physically go to his computer, hit forward, type in my name and send it to me. Just think how world has changed in 24 years. We had actuaries that, and then, you know, he was doing stuff on paper and didn't even know how to use email. And now we're talking to computers about doing work for yep. us so <laughs> it will continue i mean it's it's that old story and just thinking about you know how far things have changed in 24 years looking back there's no telling what it's going to look like in 24 years now looking forward yeah yeah totally yeah thanks again so much for being here today and sharing like on your inside experience like i can see that you are very highly experienced and knowledgeable health actuaries and uh, thanks so much again for being here today I appreciate it. Um, you know, I, I really enjoyed the stuff you had put out and because I do like learning stuff I don't really do much. You know, I may not understand every little thing you go into if you get into some, some life thing, but I, I highly recommend, you know, the audience to try to explore, you know, new things. And I would also, as part of that, you know, part of my experience has been, I've been a very active volunteer within the actuarial community, within the Academy of Actuaries and, and the Society of Actuaries. And so I, I would highly, because I, I think that helps with communication as well, as we've talked about this whole conversation, you know, interacting with different people outside of work, learning more things with, from other actuaries. I, I think it's a way to go. And I think it's helped me, you know, get to where I am. So uh, V, I appreciate the opportunity to discuss uh, kind of my career and, you know, the health actuarial world. So thank you. Yeah. Thank you so much. Have a good day. You too.